Well, Watches and Wonders is not quite just around the corner. It's probably still five weeks away. But I figured now is the time to look forward and do something of a prediction video. Except I'm not going to do prediction video because I will inevitably get 90% of it wrong and I hate being wrong. So instead, I'm going to do something different. These are the releases I would love to see because they would excite me. Some of them, they would excite me as an individual, as a watch collector as a potential purchase for the future. Some of these are going to excite me as a YouTuber because they'll shake things up and give me something to talk about. You know, they're going to be exciting because they give me content. Other things will be exciting because they're a little bit of both. Um, see you on the other side of the intro and we'll get into it. Okay, we'll do this alphabetically and I'm not going to hit every brand. I'll talk about why some brands didn't get a mention later. Start with Cartier. It's really simple. This is very personal. I would like to own a Cartier. I have a, 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 a nice feeling towards the brand. There's elements of what they do that I quite like. Big fan of the Santos. Hate the Roman numerals. I would love to see them come out with a... Cartier Santos with applied Arabics in steel, plain old everyday, run-of-the-mill core collection in their normal price range, not platinum, not white gold. That would, as a collector, get me super excited, would give me an avenue into buying Cartier. Okay, next two brands, uh, I'm going to kind of link, which is Chanel and Chopin. These comments apply mostly to Chanel, but they sort of apply to Chopin as well. Chanel has some interesting watches, but it doesn't feel like it's a single coherent collection. It feels like probably what it actually is, a bit of a scattergun of a bit here and a bit there as their interest in watches has come and gone and as they see a particular market opening up. But there's no unifying idea of this is what watches are to us and we are a serious watchmaker that expresses that idea. There's, as I say, this disparate collection. What I would love to see from Chanel, because they are huge, because they are powerful, because they have massive influence and therefore have the ability, must be taken seriously and have the ability to really shake the place up. I would like to see them introduce Something like, say, the Octo line for Bulgari. This, a line that spreads up and down across the entire spectrum, that really reaches out and says to the watch world, we're serious, we're here to make waves, we're here to make a difference, not just as a dilettante that pops in having a bit here and a bit there. As I said, that kind of idea also applies to Chopin, but less so. Chopin has a large and, I'll call it thorough, comprehensive collection in its LUC line. And anyone who looks at the LUC line will know this is a company that takes horology and takes watch collecting and takes watches seriously. They've also got this other great line, the Mila Milia line, which is a bit more fun, a bit more casual, a bit more sporty, but is a bit stunted. It doesn't go far enough. I think what I'd like to see for Chopin is kind of a subset of what I'd like to see for Chanel. Um, whereas I want Chanel to come in with some line that unifies all of what they do. What I'd like to see from Chopin would be a massive expansion of that Mila Milia line to show that it takes the kind of sports watch, slightly more casual, slightly lower end, to be blunt, watches seriously, as, as seriously as they take their LUC line. Grand Seiko, and what would really excite me here would be a new line of divers based on their, and I have to look down so I get this right, their SBGN body. Whenever I look at the current Grand Seiko divers, and I've, I've looked at them online and on my wrist and in the metal and in the hand and all that sort of thing, I get this feeling that they're, they're ponderous, they're weighty, they're just too heavy physically, emotionally, visually. They're just, 
there's just too much in them. The SBGN line, which at the moment is only a set of uh, kind of travel GMT watches, is much lighter, much lighter, much more with a, I'll call it a skin diver feel, were it to be taken across to the dive watches. And I think could transform that vision of what Grand Seiko sports watches and dive watches could be, and perhaps be the thing that punches Grand Seiko through into that sports watch area. I think one of the things that holds Grand Seiko back in the West and, and the way we look at the brand is that their dressed stuff is really lovely, but at the end of the day, their sports stuff isn't really biting. I think a dive watch collection, get rid of all your big, heavy, ponderous stuff, replace it with a much lighter, much lighter, much more svelte SBGN modeled kind of dive watch, and Grand Seiko could be ready for the next big leap forward. Hermes, really simple. I absolutely love the H08 line that they introduced, I think, at last year's Watches and Wonders, but I didn't love it enough that I would go out and purchase just that variant. Add the GMT connection, and that's going to be something that comes up a little bit here because I'm a big GMT fan. Add that GMT functionality and Hermes, that watch, the H08, will have crossed the line and be something I am beating down doors to get. Hermes, do that and you'll excite me. Hublot. Now, this is tricky because Hublot are one of already the single most exciting brands out there. They're constantly bringing new technologies, new materials, new ideas to the watch world, bringing a level of excitement few other brands do. So in some ways, Hublot simply being Hublot is enough for me. That said, I worry as a YouTuber that they don't have the influence on the watch world that they should, that the watch world is too slow to pick up the influence of the excitement, the, the surprise that Hublot can give us. I'd like to see what would get me excited about Hublot would be if they could get rid of some of the low hanging fruit that other people use to beat them up. And so that their, their role in the watch community could grow. I think the one thing for me would be get rid of using ETA and Solita movements. Now, as I, I've got to be really clear here, I personally don't care. I personally actually kind of prefer them using the ETA and Salida movements because A, they're going to be cheaper. The, the chance I could one day get one is increased. And were, were I to get one that's much easier to maintain, much more serviceable, it's just a, just a smarter movement to use. But as a YouTuber, I would love to see more brands act like Hublot. I think that's going to happen if Hublot can be seen as more serious, can swinging a bigger bat. And I think that's more likely if they do dump their ETA Salida uh, movements in the low end watches. IWC, really simple. They've got their pilot line, fantastic. Portuguese and uh, Portofino lines, brilliant. Aquatimer and Ingenieur, completely neglected. I'd be excited if uh, IWC did anything to those two lines, anything at all. JLC, oh, what would I like to see? What would excite me from Jaja Le Coult? Um, I'm, you guys are all going to laugh at my pronunciations. I'm sorry. Um, an Australian trying to pronounce French names is always going to be tricky. Okay, so... Um, you know what I'd really like to see? I'd like to see the master compressor line come back. And I don't want to see some sort of half-hearted, timeless version. I want to see them come back with some of the craziness that that line can produce. I want to see them come back with something that's completely off the wall. Don't make it a limited edition, but only make 500 of them because that's all they're ever going to sell. But... When JLC, and I've said this before, when JLC kind of let the crazy out, they just produced some really amazing and exciting watches. And I would love to see that again. Mont Blanc, what could Mont Blanc do? You know what? Recently, I've been doing the CEO thing for a day, and I'm going to repeat kind of my thoughts there. Mont Blanc, I get the feeling, is just treading water, unsure of who they are. And as a result, we as watch enthusiasts aren't really getting that excited because we're kind of seeing, 
We're trying to see who are you going to be other than a maker of like pens and, and travel equipment. And I think that the purchase and the, the purchase of Minerva by Richemont and then a pending Minerva to Mont Blanc has actually made things worse, not better. Are they, where do they fit and what are they trying to look like? And are they forward looking or backwards looking? Are they classic or retro or new and contemporary? I would like, what would excite me was if they announced at Watches and Wonders that Mont Blanc was getting rid of Minerva and becoming something, you know, really focusing on what they were going to be. Um, I think Minerva stops that from occurring, and I would love to see Mont Blanc develop a vision for who they are. Okay, Parmigiani Fleurier. Um, okay, so in one way, not a watch that really attracts me, well outside my sort of spending area, well outside the kinds of watches I like to buy. But Parmigiani, um, a brand that could be really quite exciting, could really shake up the industry and make things more interesting. And their Tonda PF line really looked like the goods there. Um, it really started to bring a brand that has a lot of power, a lot of heft behind it, horologically speaking, and give them uh, a modern market relevance. Um, so I think pretty much anything they did to that Tonda PF line to really stamp out a space for themselves and further shake up that kind of mid-level luxury area would be brilliant. I'd love to see that. Rolex. Okay, now it's easy with Rolex to set the bar low because they never do anything exciting. But you know what? And so therefore anything they did beyond change a dial color would be exciting. But you know what? I'm going to do the opposite and say that a brand with the size, the power, the resources, the reach, the ability to do, they keep, everyone keeps telling us that Rolex don't need to make anyone happy, that they can just do whatever they want to do. So that sets the bar high. If you've got that much power, then I want to see you do something really amazing. And this is what I want to see Rolex do. They have given us so much bullshit, exclusivity, luxury crap over the last two decades, whilst not giving us anything new in the world of the thing that was supposed to have made Rolex famous, you know, the tool watch for every man that you can always access. So this is what I want to see them do. I want a titanium yacht master that is made in an all new facility that is only made available online through Rolex sites and comes with the promise that anyone who places an order will get one. You might have to wait a couple of years, but if you want a Rolex, if you want a Rolex tool watch, if you want an actual product that has a, a real link to the Rolex that was great back in the 60s and 70s and made tool watches, we will give you something. That would excite me. That might actually get me buying a Rolex. Tag Heuer, really simple, dump the Formula One line. I think that Tag Heuer could be so much more than it is. It is a terrible shame. They go toe to toe with Tudor, but no one sees it because watches like the F1 kind of just drag Tudor back. Uh, sorry, drag Tag back. I'd like to see them drop that line, um, come up with something that's more kind of substantial, and I think that kind of idea, that kind of watch would really propel Tag Heuer into a much more interesting and exciting place for us enthusiasts. Vacheron Constantin, I'd like to see an outdoorsy, more sports oriented version, uh, not, not a version of the 56 line, but some, some kind of a equivalent to that. The 56 line I love. I love that it's in this more accessible area, but still comes with all of the the, the background of, uh, of Vacheron. I would love to see a sporting version of, not a sporting version of that watch, but an equivalent that was more sporting and outdoorsy than, than the, the current 56. That would, to me, really, that's a field that's open 
to Vacheron. It would really um, separate them from the other uh, sort of luxury brands that aren't really willing to go, or the Trinity brands that aren't really willing to play in that space. And I think that would be super exciting. Zenith. Okay, um, something that really I didn't realize that there isn't a Zenith dive watch. Um, so a Zenith dive watch, I think, would be really exciting. And I'd love to see a really avant-garde, modern take on a dive watch. Not some, not some sort of bullshit mid-century modern kind of classic design. Something really modern and now based on the current Defy line that was an actual dive watch. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, so that's it. Now, I've got to be careful and re remind you all these are not predictions. I don't believe a single one of these things is actually going to happen, as exciting as it would be if it did. What about you? What are the things, not that you think would happen, but would really excite you if, you, if it did? It would really change the way you looked at watches or the industry, or would perhaps make the industry uh, just a more engaging place for you. Leave it in the comments below. I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and there'll be more of this sort of stuff. I'll see you later. Bye.